and welcome to the Lost World Minute, the Minute by Minute podcast reviewing 1997 sequel Jurassic Park, one minute at a time. I'm Brad. And Dave. And today we're here to discuss Minute 48 of the Lost World. Dave, how you been? Yeah, I'm good. That's the way. How about you? Good, yeah. Had went away for a camping trip on the weekend. Um, okay. Sort of, good. the mornings are starting to warm up a bit here, so it's uh, it's getting to that time, time again where we can get out and start enjoying, enjoying life again. Good, yeah. Nature's starting to get cooler here. Oh yeah, yep. <laughs> You're about to go into winter. Yep. Yeah. We've uh, we've been getting some feedback over on the uh, Facebook group, uh, Facebook page, which is great, from uh, Lorenzo Nava, who we have uh, heard from before, and um, he was uh, sort of looking at um, some of the pre pre production stuff and. Uh, some photos of the uh, New Zealand coast, one of the national parks over there in New Zealand that uh, sort of looks a lot like our uh, early sauna shots we get when the uh, barge is approaching the island. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, that's right. Isla Sauna was originally meant to be shot at um, New Zealand and some of the natural parks there. Mm. This paper even went so far as to get... Um, location scouts done there and some of the location scout photos that they took were uh, moved into the location scout were used in concept art that they did in Photoshop early Adobe Photoshop back then are they online somewhere? Um, they're in the making of book I can post them up oh, okay yep. but uh, no that was good to sort of have a look at and um, he also posted up another uh Behind the scenes video that's on YouTube mm-hmm. um, titled Lost World Behind the Screams. Yeah. Um, there was a, um, there was a, like a exhibit that Universal put on after the movie came out. Yep. Yeah. I think it was done at Hollywood, and I'm not sure, but I think it might have been done at their Orlando location as well. Yeah, the I'm subtitle. Not I'm not sure. Yeah, the subtitle for the video says uh, Universal Studios Florida in 98. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen pictures from uh, both the Hollywood and the Orlando versions. Mm. They're pretty much equal. But the vo- uh, the video that Lorenzo uh, gave to us, or posted uh, to us, was uh, an actual video, not just a bunch of slideshow pictures. Mm-hmm. Like the other one. And unfortunately, it's not as high quality as the other video. And of course, we'll, I'll post both. I posted the other video uh, previously, but I'll post both up when this minute goes live. Yeah. Again. And this one uh, it focuses more on the animatronics than the actual props that are um, that are in pictures that are seen in the background. Mm-hmm. Because and that kind of disappoints me because there's a bunch of never before released production photos that are. In this exhibit, yep. that never get to see, and we never get to look at. I would love to be able to see those. No. Hmm. Yeah, we've we've posted stuff up before on the social media of uh, stuff that was sort of seen in the background, but we've never actually seen good high def images of. Um, and I care if this video, it might be just a sign of a lot of stuff from that time was you sort of trying to convert video VHS onto. Uh, YouTube and other stuff, so you're only looking at 360 or mm-hmm. uh, very low quality. But um, no, it's, it's great seeing some of this stuff. Um, I haven't had a chance to watch it. Has it got the trailers there as well, or is that doesn't include that? No, I can't remember if it includes that or not, but I know it includes the Mercedes. Okay. And some the Unimogs and some of that stuff. Yep. Yep. Because there's that photo I posted there a little while ago that's. Um, the trailers on display, and I'm pretty sure that's at Orlando as well. And they took it down there after, or for the um, advertising in a film. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, but no, very good. Thanks, Lorenzo, for uh, sharing with us. Um, I'll see if I can link that onto the actual uh, Facebook page as well, so everyone else can see it. And um, <laughs> The social media is going great at the moment, getting lots of interaction. Uh, about to hit 300 likes on the Facebook page. Um, yeah, we've got 700 over no over 700 on the uh, Instagram now, so that's fantastic. That's that's great. 
just needs to translate it a little bit more into listeners. <laughs> 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 if we got if we got half of that that we're uh, actually downloading the podcast, it'd be good. Um, <laughs> but uh, I might have to bribe even a couple of YouTube uh, YouTube couple of uh, iTunes reviews would be great too. So we might have to. Uh, do a little giveaway here soon to start bribing people to leave us a good review. <laughs> yeah. Find the infant tyrannosaur. Ronan can show you where the nest is. I want it on my jet. Take it directly to the infirmary at the complex in San Diego. And hurry it up. I'd love to be airborne before the female knows we're here. All right. Uh, ready to get into 48? Sure. All right. Has Wendy been at 47 in the Lost World? Nick carried the baby T-Rex into the trailers. Sarah got a table and set up for him to put the baby down on. As we open on minute 48, Sarah turns on a light and helps Nick lay the T-Rex down onto the table. At 47 minutes and 29 seconds, Nick takes his belt off and puts it around the baby's muzzle, securing it in place so it doesn't take a bite out of him. At 47 minutes and 42 seconds, Sarah pulls out an ultrasound and begins scanning the baby's leg, looking for the broken bones. And as we end minute 48, Sarah finds a hairline fracture in the baby's leg. Nick asks if it's bad, and Sarah tells him that if the leg doesn't heal straight, the baby won't be able to pivot on its ankle. It won't be able to hunt, eat, and it won't survive. We get uh, Nick bringing the animal in as uh, Sarah sort of uh, brings his table over and sets up in the middle of the trailer. Mm-hmm. And again, for the animatronic, you can see the uh, wires going down the baby's leg. Mm-hmm. And, uh, which I'm pretty sure the wires were just for a battery pack, weren't they? It wasn't actually for yeah. control of the animal. Yeah, it was a battery. It was a radio controlled uh, animatronic. It wasn't actually hydraulically controlled. It was radio controlled like the Raptors were. And so it was, it just had like a battery pack that ran from a break in the skin and uh, was stuck in a car in an actor's pocket or something. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, even in the previous minute where they're sort of running outside towards the trailer, the uh, the tail's sort of whipping around wildly. Mm-hmm. Um, and even here, as they uh, sort of drop the animal down on the on, or sit, place it down on the table, it sort of lifts its head and tries to nip it. Uh, mm-hmm. Nick. Yeah, and Sarah's like, don't let that get around you. Yeah. Because and T Rex has got one of the greatest uh, bite forces per inch of any animal in the animal kingdom. Yeah, and I can imagine the baby wouldn't be. Um, it wouldn't be as powerful yet, but it would still have a hell of a bite. Yeah. Um, but it's also great here too, as they lay the baby down on the table. He's sort of got that great skin texture. Um, yeah, it's sort of still glistening a little bit from the wetness, not because of the uh, the gloss on the on the latex, but mm-hmm. um, well, they really didn't use a gloss on the latex on these animals. They used more like a matte kind of sealant, or if they, I know they used a sealant of some kind because they mentioned uh, Sam Wilson Studios mentions that that's something they learned from the first movie. Yeah, that they were going to um, that if they're going to. Uh, they have these animals in water, or these animatronics in water, they would have to have a sealant on them. So that's something they did for the animatronics in this movie that they didn't do for the last movie, which was the reason why they had to... It took so long for them to do the main road attack scene in the first movie because the T-Rex kept filling up with water. The foam latex skin was like a sponge. Yeah, and then the uh, animatronic would get too heavy and wouldn't... uh wouldn't sort of act yeah. naturally and you can you can clearly see that in a couple of spots during that scene or that sequence where uh, the head gets a bit jittery and you can mm-hmm. it's sort of just well personally it takes me completely out of the scene and I just wish Spielberg would would have concentrated a bit more and edited that out but um, anyway what's done is done yeah but, sometimes um, you can't avoid it though you know yeah the yeah it was calibrated for a certain weight limit and the weight limit would would uh become exceeded once the skin filled up with water. Mm. But it's sort of interesting too that they went after all the issues they had there. Um, 
they kept on doing these night, or mainly nighttime water sequences. Mm-hmm. We had we had the Dilophosaur attack and the Brain Road attack in Jurassic Park, and now we're going to have this trailer set up with not one but two T-Rex that we're going to see in a minute. Um, mm. And then later on when the T-Rex is in the waterfall as well, sort of completely acting in water. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I'm sure that they're not 100% waterproof here. There's there's probably still some teething issues as well. But um, And then later in Jurassic Park 3, where we get the Spinosaur completely submerged in water. Just, mm-hmm. just sort of shows how, much like the creature design as well, just the, the design and the uh, art of making the animatronics sort of uh, grew over the years as well. And Stan Winston just took off yeah. and uh, were great at it. Mm-hmm. Well, that was another thing was um, Crichton always did these kind of uh, stormy middle of the uh, book or scenes where um, you got these big uh, kind of game-changing storms right around the middle of the book, you know? And that just so happened to kind of follow Spielberg's formula yeah. where both in The Lost World, Jurassic Park, and Jaws, you have the main, the big main attack at the very center of the movie. Mm. Jurassic Park, you have the main road attack, and in uh, The Lost World, you have the trailer attack, and then in Jaws, you have the 4th of July beach attack. Yeah. Yeah, well, and it's it's interesting, too, where you say about the storms. We only just talked about uh, Sphere a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Same thing, same you know, major, major storm in the middle of that. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it's it's definitely something Crichton done, and uh, Spielberg carried it over into the films as well. Yeah, but like I said, he had already set up that formula with Jaws a bit, mm. so it was kind of perfect that Spielberg was the one to get the Jurassic Park franchise. You know? Yeah, you could only imagine what a James Cameron version would have been. Maybe there would have been oh. something a lot larger happened in the visitor center. Mm-hmm. I sometimes imagine the James Cameron version, and I would think that James Cameron of the early 90s would have created a movie that's much more like the novel, much more grandiose, and much larger in terms of special effects. Of course, he probably still would have used uh, Stan Winston Studios and ILM. He'd already worked with them a lot previously on Mm. movies like Terminator and Aliens and The Abyss. Yeah. And so... Yeah. So... Oh, I don't know. I reckon he would have distanced himself from the book. Just sort of going off what he done with Aliens. So if you're going, right, that's the mythology. I'm not going to touch touch what uh, Ridley Scott done in the original. I'm going to make this my own. Tell a completely different story. Um, and I'm just wondering if he'd, if he'd look at the book for inspiration or he'd say, no, that's what Crichton done. That's how that exists. I'm going to do, do this my way. Um, certainly by 93, he was... Uh, he was up there as a director, so I don't think he would have had yeah. much backlash if he uh, said, mm-hmm. nah, this is mine, I'm going to do what I want with it, or uh, or whatever, but... Well, I, I know. know that he at least had made it totally similar to the book. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think it would, have been, uh, it would have been rated R and probably uh, much more horrific than Spielberg made it. Spielberg kind of made it a little bit more family-friendly. He made it a PG-13 Instead of because the book is definitely a hard R book, you know. Yeah, yep. Yeah. But most of that most of that comes down to um. Sorry. Oh, most of that comes down to sort of the uh, animal attacks and that. Um, exactly though. And the gore. I mean, there's, yeah, there's um descriptions of Nedry holding his own intestines in his arms before he dies, stuff like that. Yeah. I think um Crichton probably would have like or not Crichton uh. Cameron would have probably liked that kind of the idea of that kind of uh, visceral horror, hmm. you know. But you can sort of there's ways to get around that too. You could sort of Nedry could look down and look down in horror, and you not have the camera go down to what he's looking at and just have a hand come up with blood on it. Yeah. Um, stuff like that you could do to get around it. Well, we've seen what Spielberg done. He just had the whole attack happen inside the jeep, and you're left to make up your own mind or yeah, imagine the horror of what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of Jurassic Park is more implicit horror than Crichton's explicit horror. 
Yeah. You know? Yep. But that's kind of what makes the uh, book or the movie so great is a lot of it's implied. You don't actually, in the, for example, in the script when uh, Burke dies, we actually, I think, see it happen. We yep. see it bulk down uh, the female's throat. But in the, but in the uh, movie, all we see is the waterfall turn red. Mm-hmm. You know? And the crunching of bone. Bold. Which is almost more terrifying than seeing it. Yeah. You know? Yep. Yeah, just that sound. <laughs> yeah. It's like when a dog, you give a dog a bone, it just sits there and gnaws away on it. It's like, ugh. I know, it's a kind of gnarly crunching sound. Yeah. Yep. But we, uh, we do get very, uh, one very, uh, on screen death here in a minute, a couple of minutes' time yeah, with Eddie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. Where were we? Um, <laughs> oh, Ian's uh, exactly. yeah, Ian's sort of holding uh, Kelly back as the baby's freshening around a bit, and um, he says, uh, where is it? "Oh, what did you hit it with a stick?" Um, again, caught saying her for a female, mm-hmm. but um, I don't. He wouldn't be able to tell the difference anyway. He'd be still probably under the assumption that everything's female. Um, yeah, well, he knows that the animals are breeding and that they've, um, and that they've transferred, uh, some of them have trans, uh, sexualized into males. Yeah, yeah. Because of the frog DNA. Yep. But I don't think he, but he, the last time we saw a T-Rex, he was kind of running from it and not trying to pay attention to the colors, especially since it was in the middle of a dark road in the rain. Mm. And so he's probably, he probably has no, any. I'm sure he has no idea what a baby one would look like, you know? Yeah. Yep. And I'm sure, too, like, a lot of the times, I know, personally, if you see something, you always sort of call it a female, whether it's a car or an animal, yeah. um, whether it's actually a female or male, it's sort of, yeah. That is true. She's yeah. she's beautiful, isn't she? <laughs> we get the... Uh, Enrique over the radio, so Ian goes back to the radio station and tells Lady Nut wrong frequency. And, mm-hmm. um, tries another channel, and, uh, we get to see there's another monitor on the table, which I'm guessing is the one from earlier, they've just moved it, so it's in the background for this shot, with the, uh, Stegosaur data on it again. Yeah. Um, because yeah, it was pointing... Uh, uh, it's flashing the same animal, um, profiles that it was flashing earlier. Yeah. Yeah, but it was on the other side of the radio station earlier. Yeah. Whether it's the same monitor or, or if there's just a second one there showing the same stuff as well. But um, That's one thing I never really noticed in the film before. Whenever I heard of it happening, I thought it was the uh, computer monitor that's up in the front near the steering wheel. Mm. But um, we don't yeah, actually there's get... There's a monitor up there. We never yeah. see whatever, whatever shows on it, but... No, no, it's never on. But we get Sarah starts pulling supplies out of the storage cabinet here. Um, Mm -hmm. We don't really learn. She doesn't sort of say what she's looking for or anything, but you can tell she's probably looking for uh, some sort of tranquilizer. Or even medical supplies, you know. I'm sure they brought a first aid kit along with them, you know. Yeah, yep. Um, But we finally get the uh, baby acting a bit dangerous here, nipping at Nick. And um, he takes off his belt and puts it around the animal's snout. To uh, so it doesn't bite. And as he said earlier, Sarah says, "Don't let that get on you." Um, but she comes back with, from the supply area with uh, an ultrasound. Mm-hmm. And starts uh, going up and down the baby's leg, looking for the uh, fracture. Um, and she spills out some uh, medical mumbo jumbo about the uh, bones, the joints, and uh, finds a hairline fracture. Which you'd think with a grown grown man, even though Ludlow's small, the um, you'd think him falling back on the animal would be a bit a bit worse a fracture than just a hairline fracture in the leg bone. Yeah, but true. Nick asks her how bad is it, and uh, she starts going on about uh, if it doesn't heal properly, the baby won't be able to pivot on its ankle bone and won't be able to hunt and feed, and will end up dying. Mm-hmm. But that's where we uh, end up on minute 48. But um, it's just good here too. And a, a work again while she's trying to ultrasound it, sort of kicking. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I'd probably be a little bit wary of the claws on its feet. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Anything else here you want to bring up before we get out of here for the week? Yeah, I think we're good. All right. All right, guys. Let's get the hell out of here. Contact details are on the website, thelostworldminute.com. You can email feedback to thelostworldminute at gmail.com. Facebook, The Lost World Minute. Twitter, at The Lost World Minute. And Instagram, The Lost World Minute. Easy to remember. Yeah, yeah, very easy to remember. (laughs) Uh, David, thank you for joining me for this recording. And uh, we'll be back. I've been Brad. I'm Dave. And uh, we'll talk to you all later. Talk to you later. Bye. It is absolutely imperative that we work with the Costa Rican Department of Biological Preserves to establish a set of rules for the preservation and isolation of that island. These creatures require our absence to survive, not our help. And if we could only step aside and trust in nature, Life will find a way.